Ha. I had a crazy day that I don't have time to tell you about. Well, if, if we can fit it in somewhere, uh, if, if there's extra time somewhere at the end of something, I'll tell you about the crazy day. The comedians, you know, the crazy thing happened to me on the way to the theater. It really did. Okay. But this is more important. Talking about Emmanuel prayer and how to experience the living, tangible, interactive friendship presence of Jesus. All right. And for today, it's how I came into Emmanuel prayer or my personal journey to the Emmanuel approach. And let's see. Forward. Yes. So one, Christian faith together with science. Even as a small child, I like to understand how things worked. I had that phase that all children have of asking why about everything, but for me, it just never stopped. I love science because it helped me understand how everything in the physical world worked, and I also wanted to understand how my Christian faith fit into the picture. I wanted to understand how everything in the world worked and I perceived that science and Christianity were the sources of truth that would best help me with this. I also wanted to be a part of God's plan to care for the world. I can, I can remember standing in my bedroom as a four-year-old and thinking very clearly, I want to figure out what God's will is for my life, what God wants me to do to be a part of his plan for taking care of the world, and then I will do it. Now, at the age of four, my best discernment regarding how to most effectively participate in God's plan was that I should get a PhD in physics and then work with one of the research teams studying controlled nuclear fusion in hopes of developing an unlimited clean energy resource and thereby prevent the planet from spiraling into ecological disaster. <laughs> and well, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't understand the details of nuclear fusion at four, but I, that actually is mostly accurate. As you can see, I was a very lighthearted, carefree preschool child. <laughs> so, you know, most children, they want to be an astronaut one week and a fireman the next week. But me, I persisted with that life plan for the next 16 years of school through grade school, junior high, high school and college. I studied science, science and more science. And I constantly worked to integrate my Christian faith with what I was learning about science. So I graduated from college with a bachelor's degree in physics and a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a bachelor's degree in biology and a minor in math and a pretty strong understanding regarding how my Christian faith and science could work together. So mostly I studied. Um, people have like letter, you know, you can have a letterman, you have a letter jacket in basketball or football, or whatever. I just like lettered in studying. <laughs> so at that point, I made a slight adjustment to my plan. Um, I basically realized that uh, my gifting and my joy and my gifting were more uh, science and people together as opposed to just science. And thank you, Jesus, uh, had made the shift from graduate school research to medical school. Uh, free advice for any young people here, as you're trying to decide like, what to study and what career to follow, pay attention to what you're naturally gifted, where you're, where you're gifted and what gives you joy. So I learned a lot more science in medical school and I worked hard to integrate my Christian faith with everything I was learning about medicine. And I also uh, no, focused my, I narrowed my focus to psychiatry. This is a little funny, actually. So I went into medical school planning to be a general practitioner, which is you kind of do everything, especially if you're rural. And in th the third and fourth years of medical school, as you study all the different parts of medicine, I kept noticing myself thinking, picturing myself as a general practitioner and thinking, how can I do everything else in the, sh in the least amount of time so I could have more time for psychiatry? And then one day, like it dawned on me, I could just go into psychiatry. <laughs> no, thank you, Jesus, for that, for that insight. As I went through four years of specialty training in psychiatry, I, le I learned even more science, <clears throat> and I worked hard to integrate my Christian faith with everything I was learning about the brain and the mind. In addition to studying psychology and brain science, I studied teachings from Agnes Sanford, Francis McNutt, the comment about, you know, 20 years ago, you wouldn't be able to find a book on emotional learning. Well, Francis McNutt and Agnes Sanford, there'd be two if you looked for them, you could find them, just for the record there. Uh, Francis McNutt, John and Paul Sanford, Charles Kraft, many others, who included prayer and Christian spirituality as central foundational components of their care for people with mental health concerns. So when I finished my training and started my private practice, from the very first day, <clears throat> 
I was very actively working to integrate psychological, psychology and brain science with prayer and other biblical principles. For example, I used a combination of medication and cognitive therapy for management of acute symptoms and a combination of insight-oriented psychotherapy and prayer for emotional healing for resolution of any underlying traumatic memories that were contributing to the problem. And for those of you not familiar with prayer for emotional healing, in my practice 30 years ago, it would look something like this. We would start with focusing on the presenting problem, such as anxiety or depression, and whatever you walked in my office with saying, this hurts, can you fix it? And ask the Lord to lead the person to any underlying traumatic memories that were contributing. Once the person remembered and connected with an underlying traumatic memory, we would ask the Lord to come into the memory with healing. If the person did not perceive the Lord's presence in the memory or experience resolution of the trauma, we would engage in some very basic troubleshooting, such as checking for bitterness, unconfessed sin, demonic interference. Unfortunately, when I first began this kind of Christian psychiatric work, only a very small percentage of my patients, maybe like if I was painfully honest, it would be like 5% experienced dramatic healing. And that was glorious when it happened, but 5%, which is persistently painful. I really cared about my patients. Most of them were in, were in a lot of pain, and the tools I was using were mostly just helping them cope. Every week, I would spend many hours with people I cared about who were in a lot of pain and who I could only marginally help. Now, the upside of that picture is that persistent pain provided intense, persistent motivation for me to keep learning. So I studied eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR. Some people have probably heard about that. I, and integrated these tools and techniques into what I was already doing. And as I mastered these tools and techniques and gained skill with troubleshooting, I saw a lot more dramatic resolution of traumatic memories, maybe 30% or 40%, instead of previously very discouraging 5%. But even 40% meant that I was still spending a lot of time each week with people who I cared about and who were still in a lot of pain. So I studied Theophostic. I'm, I'm sure there's people who've heard of that as well and integrated those tools and techniques into what I was already doing. As I, as I mastered Theophostic principles and techniques, gained more skill with troubleshooting and started getting my own healing, which improved my discernment, faith and capacity. That's just a, a quick one, anybody, like, Always a good idea, get your own healing, that'll help all kinds of ways. <laughs> I saw another significant increase with respect to dramatic resolution of traumatic memories. However, after you know, increasing dramatically for a while, which was glorious, it eventually kind of plateaued around maybe 75%. I mean, I, I wasn't actually counting, I didn't have time to do rigorous, I didn't have a graduate student to like work for pennies to like do that, the grunt work. But just an intuitive estimate, maybe 75%. There were still certain patients in my practice who were not getting resolution of underlying traumatic memories. And we worked hard to address every blockage we could find, every, block, every possible blockage we could think of. Vows, judgments, bitterness, persistent sin, denial, demonic interference, dissociation, guardian lies, and more. But in spite of all this, these people were still not getting resolution of their traumatic memories. So at this point in the story of my journey toward the Emmanuel approach, <clears throat> I need to take a few minutes to present a brief summary of brain-mind-spirit capacity and to talk about how this aspect of our brain-mind-spirit systems interacts with healing for psychological trauma. When we, ref when we refer to the capacity of a physical system, we're referring to how much will it hold or how much can it carry. For example, the capacity, the capacity of a bucket refers to how much liquid it can hold before overflowing. The capacity of a bridge refers to how much weight can travel across it before it collapses. And the capacity of an electrical circuit refers to, don't do this at home. These are trained professionals. Actually, no, that's not a trained professional. That's an incompetent homeowner who wants to burn his house down. But the capacity of electrical circuit refers to how much current it can carry before blowing a fuse or burning out components. When we refer to capacity in the context of emotional healing, we're referring to the capacity of the person's biological brain, non-biological non mind and spirit. We're referring to how much biological, psychological and spiritual intensity a person can handle before some part of their system, their combined brain, mind, spirit system, quote unquote, blows a fuse and causes the person to disconnect in some way. 
Now, capacity limitations of the non-biological mind and spirit are hard to study with the usual scientific research methods. So there's not this clear evidence about those, at least accessible to the mainstream uh, science that I'm aware of. But there is an extensive body of research demonstrating capacity limitations for the biological brain. And it is especially easy, it is especially straightforward to demonstrate capacity limitations of an individual nerve cell or neuron. For example, there are many studies showing that if you take an individual nerve cell, it will function well if it's given a, an appropriate load to carry, but it will begin to malfunction if it is stimulated in too intensely, too frequently, or for too long a duration. And if the overload continues, it'll eventually get sick and die. And that's real easy to document. The research demonstrating that the biological brain also has capacity limitations at higher levels of functioning. More complex, not as easy to follow, but if you if you really study it carefully, it's just as compelling. And Dr. Wilder is nodding over there, my buddy in brain science. Capacity limitations have many sobering implications, such as working too long without adequate sleep, possibly causing brain injury. If I had not gone to medical school and residency, I'd be even smarter, or I'd be I'd still have I'd still have some brain cells left. <laughs> That's one that they hadn't done that research when I was still in medical school and research and, and residency. Don't want to think about it. For the purposes of this presentation, we are interested in the ways in which capacity limitations affect healing for psychological trauma. The first, ah, I'm still actually got the right slide. Amazing. I must, somehow I must be getting healing and maturity skills over the years because I don't think I've ever done a presentation before where I'm this synchronized. All right. <laughs> So Chris said, we are, formation is happening. We are, I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago. That's good news. So the first key point is that in order for healing work with traumatic memories to be effective, the person receiving ministry needs to be able to connect with the emotions in the memory and needs to be able to stay connected as he processes through the memory. If he can't connect with the emotions or if he can't stay connected all the way through, he won't be able to resolve the traumatic memory. A diagram will be helpful in explaining my next points. In this diagram, in that diagram, the vertical arrow, the vertical arrow labeled capacity represents the capacity of the person's combined brain, mind, spirit system. And the series of hills on your right represents the intensity of different parts of a specific traumatic memory. For example, one of my friends was in a car accident. The first small peak in this figure could, rep could represent the intensity as his car hit a patch of gravel he lost control. The second larger peak could represent the intensity as he swerved off the road into the guardrail. And the third peak could represent the intensity as the car went through the guardrail rail off the bridge and into the river below, maximum intensity. As the diagram illustrates, if there is some part of the traumatic memory that exceeds the person's joy strength, that exceeds his capacity for doing hard things, that, that exceeds his capacity for staying connected to painful memories, then he will either be completely unable to connect with the memory, as indicated by the lower horizontal dotted line arrow, or he will disconnect in some way when he gets to the place that exceeds his capacity, as indicated by the upper horizontal, upper horizontal dotted line arrow. So, if some part of a traumatic memory exceeds the person's capacity, he won't be able to connect or stay connected, and therefore won't be able to resolve the trauma. Back to the 25% of my clients who are still not getting breakthrough resolution of underlying traumatic memories. As I mentioned earlier, my success rate with the combination of EMDR and Theophosic had kind of plateaued at 75%. There seemed to be a group of people who were still not getting resolution of underlying traumatic memories in spite of working long and hard to address every possible blockage we could think of. Now, 75% is a lot better than 5%, and it's even a lot better than 30% or 40%. But one out of every four of my patients were still in a lot of pain, coping in, and limping instead of, instead of experiencing lasting, life-changing healing. Eventually, I got to, the, to a place of profound, humble powerlessness. And in the middle of a particularly difficult day in which I was working with several of these people, I spontaneously prayed something along the lines of, Lord, I'm totally stumped. I know you can heal these people. I know you want to heal these people, but we don't know how to move forward. Please show us what to do. 
And within seconds of finishing this, that prayer, this is one of the clearest experiences I've ever had of feeling like God talked to me, spoke to me. Within seconds of finishing that prayer, a completely new thought came quietly but clearly into my mind that I should turn away from focusing on the traumatic memories. I, could I should take a time out from kind of hammering into the, tra into the traumatic memories. And instead, I should focus on helping the people to establish a connection with Jesus and then help them just spend time with Jesus. As I started to focus on helping the clients from this particularly difficult day just be with Jesus, I also realized that we were dealing with capacity problems. Now, Charlotte and I had been learning about capacity several months. We had, we had actually just, just started learning about capacity several months earlier, actually from Dr. Wilder. But at, the time I, at, that, at that time, I had not made the connection between the capacity principles and the people in my practice who are stuck. And making the connection, I realized the reason these people are stuck and weren't getting resolution for their trauma was they didn't have enough capacity to stay connected to the memories. Now, here's a really important point regarding capacity and emotional healing. Identifying and resolving other clutter and blockages won't fix the problem if the person doesn't have enough capacity to stay connected all the way through the memories. An analogy, an analogy would be a physical task with the questions of strength versus willingness. If I'm strong enough to push my neighbor's car out of the snowbank, but I'm choosing not to because I'm afraid of getting wet, I'm angry about someone resolve conflict with that neighbor, I've made a vow never to push cars out of snowbanks. If that's the problem, then dealing with my fear or bitterness or vow will, will resolve the problem. And if I become willing and choose to help, I'll be able to. This is a primitive movie. <laughs> However, if I simply don't have the physical strength, then addressing these other issues will not get my neighbor's car out of the snowbank. Becoming willing and choosing to help will not overcome my lack of physical strength. With each of the persistently stuck people from this particularly difficult day, I had, been I had been focusing on willingness and choice. Why weren't they willing to connect with the memories? Why were they repeatedly choosing to disconnect partway through? But the problem was capacity. These people didn't have enough capacity. They were perfectly willing, and they kept choosing to try to go into the memories, but they simply didn't have enough capacity, so they either couldn't connect or could not stay connected all the way through. This was why they were stuck. This is why they couldn't resolve the, these certain specific traumatic memories and why none of our other interventions had solved the problem. What also occurred to me as soon as I made the capacity connection was that the Lord's suggestion to focus on helping these people be with him was a brilliant solution to the capacity problem. In other sessions, I had seen that a person could stay connected I, could, I had seen that a person could stay connected through the, through the worst imaginable memories if she perceived the Lord's presence with her. As this, di as this diagram illustrates, I'm pointing to the one I can see, Jesus has infinite capacity. He seems to be glad to be with us in and through any possible situation we can get into, and he never becomes anxious or upset. It seems that if a person can perceive the Lord's presence and feel his presence with her, then capacity, present, then capacity problems resolve and the healing, the healing process can move forward. And an, an important caveat or note there is a person can borrow capacity from Jesus in proportion to the strength of their connection with Jesus. So there's kind of an important footnote there for people like Jim Wilder and me who are concerned about those things. Um, and the rest of you should be too. This Jesus connection solution for, inadequ for inadequate capacity appears to be very similar to the way in which a in which appears to be very similar to the way in which being with a safe, non-anxious adult can resolve capacity problems for a child. For example, if you have a little kid standing at the top of the stairway to a dark basement, the ball burnt out, and you say, "Hey, can you go behind the furnace and get me those tools you know that I left there last week?" If the child does not have the capacity, they just stand there immobilized. Even if, even if they're a compliant child, it's not about rebellion, it's not about disobedience, they just can't make themselves do it. However, that same child will easily and willingly go down those same stairs if you have dad holding their hand. 
One, one variable changes, and all of a sudden, the whole equation is completely different. Now, I had seen this happen spontaneously in theophostic-based sessions, in my EMDR theophostic sessions, where occasionally a person would just suddenly spontaneously perceive Jesus's presence with them in the middle of a painful memory. And it would happen spontaneously once in a while, and I'd seen that happen. But it, until the Lord directed me to spend time very deliberately helping these people just be with them, it had never occurred to me that we could do it on purpose, that we could intentionally, systematically facilitate those experiences of perceiving and connecting with the Lord's Emmanuel presence. And as these pieces all came together, a light bulb came on for me. Hey, this could work for any of my other, for like all my patients that are stuck, all my patients that are having capacity problems. What if we tried a just be with Jesus intervention in any situation where the person seemed to be encountering capacity issues? Whenever the recipient seemed to be having difficulty going into a memory due to capacity problems, or seemed to be ejecting from a memory due to capacity problems, what if we asked the Lord to help, him, help her perceive his presence and to help her just be with him? <clears throat> so I tried this approach with every one of my patients, with every patient in my practice who had been so persistently stuck, all of whom seemed to be having capacity problems, and in almost every situation, the person was eventually able to perceive the Lord's presence. With some of these people, we needed to spend a number of sessions. Some of them had complex blockages. It took a while to untangle and get out of the way. But everybody who, but most of the, in most situations, we were able to figure that out, get the blockages out of the way. And everybody who was able to perceive the Lord's presence was eventually able to press through painful memories that they had previously been unable to handle. And they were able to perceive the Lord's presence with them through the whole process, which seemed to help tremendously. Same way as you hold dad's hand and all of a sudden an impossible task is like, I can do this. The whole process seemed easier and less painful and also went faster, which I mean, sometimes people kind of think like efficiency is somehow dishonorable. But if somebody is in your office and they've got limited time and money, you know, that it's a real gift to find the best way to do it, that's a real gift to your patients um, in the real world. Okay. So as all of this unfolded, <clears throat> I, began to, I, I began to formulate what we now call Emmanuel interventions, specific systematic interventions with a very focused goal of helping the person receiving ministry to perceive the Lord's living presence and to establish an interactive connection with him. Emmanuel interventions are discussed in detail in the Big Lion book. The Big Lion book has a title, but it's the Big Lion book. I mean, if you look at the table, there's a book that has a huge line on the cover. So it's the Big Lion book. That's what everybody calls it now. So they're discussed more in detail in the Big Lion book. But here's a very, very brief description for this story of my journey to the Emmanuel approach. So the most basic, simple component of an Emmanuel intervention is just a simple, specific, explicit invitation and request along the lines of, Lord, I make a heart invitation for you to be with me here in this place. I also ask you to help me perceive your presence and to help me establish an interactive connection with you. And I've been amazed, I've been amazed by how many people would be in a memory. And this is a memory they've had for 50 years and they've worked on in therapy for, you know, for hundreds of hours. And we do that little thing and I'll say, oh my goodness, Jesus is sitting in front of me. And somehow I can, I know it's, tr I, I can feel the truth. He's been here the whole time. I just, I was never able to perceive his presence until we actually invited him and asked. And that's, I've lost count of how many times that's happened. Now, if the recipient is not able to perceive the Lord's presence and establish an interactive connection, you work with her to troubleshoot. And that's like the rest of Emmanuel interventions is, is a, whole, a whole toolbox of troubleshooting tools. For example, the recipient may not be able to perceive the Lord's presence because she's afraid that she will feel unbearable shame if she allows somebody else into the memory she's working with. And all you know, if you have a terrible shame memory, like the last thing you want is somebody else to come in the room and turn on the light. And when you help her address that blocking fear so that she, that she is so that she is willing to let him come into the memory, she then becomes able to perceive his presence. Or the recipient may not be able to let him come close enough for a good connection because she's afraid he might hurt her. People who have memory anchored, you know, things about people being safe, if, not, not safe if they're close. If he gets too close, he might be unsafe. When you help her to address that blocking fear so that she is willing to let him come closer, she will then experience a good, a good interactive connection. Just two examples of kind of a, a toolbox of that kind of troubleshooting. Now, 
there rarely you'll have a situation where at least so far there's, there's a handful that I haven't been able to figure out yet. But most of the time, you troubleshoot persistently and you eventually find a way through you to identify the blockages, the blocking fears or whatever, move them out of the way. And in every situation in which these manual interventions have worked, so that the recipient has been able has been able to perceive the Lord's presence, establish a good interactive connection, receive from him and be with him, capacity problems at that particular point in the process have seemed to resolve and the person has been able to take the next step forward. I'm still synchronized with my slides. <laughs> uh, on the way down here, you know, I'm, I've been terrible triggered about presentations forever. And so on the way driving down here, never waste a good trigger. Chris said like, don't waste, <laughs> don't waste a good trial. Don't waste a good trigger. If you're triggered, you might as well get something out of it. And so we're, we're, we're on the highway and Charles driving. And I'm like, oh, I, I'm, I, I'm triggered about this. And so we actually, I got, I got, some significant healing on the way here. And I think that could be part of what's happening. This is really funky. So you are witnessing the fruit. This is right here is the first opportunity to witness the manifestation of the fruit from the trip from Chicago to Nashville 2022. All right, so back to manual interventions for everybody. As just described, at first I was using these manual interventions just for those capacity situations. <clears throat> and I was amazed by the high percentage of success. I was thrilled with the positive results but I was using this particular intervention only for those capacity situations. And this is actually a bit embarrassing, but I was so excited about that that it was like many months before it occurred to me, like, what about all the rest of my patients? And these are things like afterwards are so obvious, but somehow like when you're the first person on that trail, nobody else has been there before, obvious stuff is not as obvious. So as soon as I had that thought, I began to try manual interventions in every session, regular client sessions, consultation sessions, mentoring group sessions, sessions with friends, family. As soon as we got to a traumatic memory, the first thing we would do was help the person connect with, perceive Jesus' presence and connect with him. And once she could perceive his presence and establish a good connection, we would turn to Jesus for leadership and resources throughout the rest of the session. This would be especially, especially helpful if we would encounter any difficulties whether or not they had to do with capacity. I mean, the, the capacity problem was one nothing else worked for, and this one was beautiful, but it worked for everything else too. Any other problem you could encounter, if you had a connection with Jesus that was interactive and clear, you say, Jesus, well, can you please help us? This is really sweet for the facilitator. I mean, well, sometimes therapists have trouble with it because they did all that work to learn all this complicated stuff. Um, <laughs> But for the people who have a good connection, a really cool thing is you can train lay people to do this. And in the third world countries where we have tens of millions of people with PTSD, I mean, God bless, in Ukraine, we're making people with PTSD like 10,000 a day. It's like, if they have a good connection with Jesus and you have a problem, you basically say, is Jesus still there? Focus on him, ask him for help and tell me what happens. For, for, for recipients who are able to perceive the Lord's presence and connect with him in this way, the simplest additional nudges were often all that was needed. Sometimes all I had to do was ask, what's Jesus doing? Or I might make a very simple suggestion such as, keep focusing on Jesus and ask him for more help. The results were essentially the same as when I tried the Emmanuel Inventions for capacity uh, sessions. Most recipients were able to perceive the Lord's presence and establish an interactive connection. And then every aspect of the healing work would go forward more quickly and easily, just as with the capacity problem sessions. I was amazed by the high percentage of success, thrilled with the positive results. So from Emmanuel interventions to the Emmanuel approach for emotional healing. Um, start at the very beginning of the session. For reasons I still do not fully understand, at least at that time in my career, Emmanuel interventions seemed to be most effective in the context of working inside of traumatic memories. And the one thought I've had there is light is easier to see in the darkness I think it was uh, sometimes much easier to spot the Lord's presence if you're in the middle of a really dark place. In any case, I had most often observed Emmanuel interventions to be successful in the context of working inside of a traumatic memory, and I certainly had the most faith for that context. Therefore, when it occurred to me that we could try this Emmanuel intervention thing at the beginning of a session, even before getting into a traumatic memory, I kind of resisted the thought, but it kept coming back. Why not start each session with an Emmanuel intervention 
So the first thing the person does would be to perceive and connect with Jesus. We could then interact with Jesus in this more tangible way throughout the whole session. We could even ask him for guidance regarding what to work on. And the more I observe the benefits of recipients engaging with Jesus for their healing work inside traumatic memories, the more I thought about at least experimenting with trying Emmanuel interventions at the very beginning. So during the time I was kind of like, kept having that thought, like, ah, I've never seen that work. I'm not sure if it's going to work. I don't know. So someone, one of my clients comes in and sits down at the beginning of her appointment and reported that she had just had an interesting and wonderful experience. As she, was, as she had been driving down the highway several days earlier, it had suddenly occurred to her, why do I have to wait until I'm in Dr. Lehman's office? Why can't I try that Emmanuel thing at other times? I wonder what would happen if I tried it right now. So she welcomed the Lord to be with her and asked him to help her perceive his presence. And there he was, sitting in the path. He was, he's, riding <laughs> he, he's riding shotgun. And she finished with, Somehow it's now clear to me that he'd been there the whole time, but I just hadn't been able to see him until I asked. I was able to perceive his presence sitting right beside me for the rest of the trip. And that, like I said, that same, I've heard that same comment so many times I've lost count. A few days later, another client comes in and reports that she'd had an interesting and wonderful experience. She'd been in her dentist's office several days earlier for a procedure she knew was going to be painful and she'd been dreading it. So she's sitting in the dentist chair waiting for the procedure to start, and it occurs to her, why not try that Emmanuel thing that Dr. Lehman does? So she, goes, she invites Jesus to be with her, help me perceive your presence. He's like, there he was. I could sense his presence very powerfully. He's standing next to the dental chair, right? He's standing right next to the chair. He's holding my hand. I focused on him for the whole thing, and she hardly felt any pain or fear. So those two experiences provided additional encouragement for taking the next step if the Emmanuel intervention prayer works for people who are driving down the highway and sitting in a dentist chair, maybe I should go ahead and start trying it at the beginning of sessions, even before the person gets to a painful memory. Furthermore, I have been describing my experiences with Emmanuel interventions to Dr. Wilder. During, there was a couple of years that we, we, every Friday morning, we'd talk on the phone for an hour or two, just we were brainstorming and all kinds of stuff. And so anything either of us were, were, were figuring out or stumbling over, we would, hey, this interesting thing happened, what do you think? So I've been talking, I've been describing these things during, the, during that little season there. And as a result of these conversations, he had developed some variations that he had begun using in a recovery group at his church. He was, he was routinely trying his Emmanuel event interventions outside of traumatic memories. And he had also come up with this idea of starting the session by recalling a past positive experience with God and then deliberately stirring up appreciation in that context. Now I'm going to talk more tomorrow about how that kind of prepares your brain, mind, and spirit to connect with God, but for right now, it just does. And most significantly, he had been observing consistently good results, even when not working inside of traumatic memories. So kind of like I got to cheat. Somebody else already tried it. You know, it's, it's harder when you're the first person out in the ice. If somebody else goes first, you know, you kind of wait a little while and see if they go down. And then if they're fine, you say, okay, okay I'll follow you out there, Jim. So I took the next step and began experimenting with the manual interventions in combination with that positive God memory and deliberate appreciation preparation exercise at the beginning of each session. And once again, I was encouraged by the results. The more sessions I did this way, the more convinced I became that it's a good idea to spend time connecting with Jesus before going into pain, painful memory work. I mean, the other way it works. The, like, do a bunch of your own work humanly as a therapist and get into the painful memory and rummage around in there for a long time and then eventually invite Jesus. That actually works. But when you get it, like when you bring him in right at the beginning, it works better. Another benefit of the weekly phone calls I was having with Jim was that we came up with the idea for Emmanuel approach safety nets. I'll discuss, uh, I'm going to discuss Emmanuel approach safety nets in more detail tomorrow, but here's a very short summary. So the, the client or ministry recipient starts each session with recalling and connecting with a positive memory and then establishing an interactive connection with Jesus in the context of the positive memory. And then the positive memory and interactive connection with Jesus provide a safe, comfortable home base that the recipient can go back to. So later in the session, if you bump into, if you come, if you encounter anything you don't know how to handle, you can just coach the person to go back to the positive memory and connect with Jesus from the beginning of the session still synchronized with my slides. Having this safe, comfortable home base to come back to provides a safety net. 
you have been with me before, Charlotte. Have I ever been done this before? I, that's really, yeah, interesting. Wow, isn't that cool? So C, new, under, <clears throat> new understanding regarding traumatic memories. So yet another benefit of our weekly phone calls was that we were formulating our understanding of the pain processing pathway, traumatic memories, and how to resolve traumatic memories. And I'll discuss that in more detail tomorrow too. But here's a quick summary for just for the story of how I got to the manual approach. So one, a number of specific processing tasks need to be, need to be successfully completed for a painful experience to be adequately metabolized so that it does not become a traumatic experience. Two, failure to complete one or more of these tasks results in a traumatic experience. Three, memories for traumatic experiences are resolved when we finish the processing tasks that were not completed at the time of the original experience. And this can happen only when specific necessary conditions and resources are provided. So as I coach people to engage directly with Jesus for guidance and help, I realize that for recipients who are able to maintain an adequate interactive connection, Jesus would do a beautiful job of caring for each of the unfinished processing tasks. He seemed to know all about this stuff. He, he knew all about the unfinished processing tasks. He knew, all, he knew all about each of the tasks. He would identify the unfinished tasks, set up the necessary conditions, provide the necessary resources, as long as we kept turning to him and asking him for help and we had a strong enough connection. In fact, watching Jesus repeatedly and skillfully help recipients navigate through remedial processing tasks was one of the observations that convinced me that this technique was really effective and, and legitimate and, worth, and valid. My understanding the pain processing pathway well enough to be able to recognize what he was doing convinced me that we could count on him to lead the process. It was actually, I mean, you, even if you don't know anything, he'll still do it. But if you understand all this stuff, you'll realize you could see what he was doing. And you'd be like, look, there, oh, there it is. There's the three. There's, this is the thing Dr. Wilder and I talked about last week. There, he's doing it right there. Jesus would provide the guidance and assistance necessary to resolve any trauma as long as the recipient had an adequate connection and we kept turning back to Jesus for guidance and help. And also, understanding that pain processing pathway for the more advanced troubleshooting stuff, it was really, it's a very helpful theoretical framework when you're developing more advanced troubleshooting tools to understand that way about how the brain works. Priority correction with respect to symptom relief. <clears throat> So I started my career with the goal is symptom relief. People came into my office saying, I'm in pain, fix it. Nobody ever came into my office and said, can you help me remove blockages so I can like have a better spiritual life? Yeah, I've got panic attacks, they're ruining my life, make them go away. You know, I've got depression that's ruining my life, make them go away. So that's, that's kind of the perspective I had and that, that was kind of my whole, uh, my focus. And I had observed that when people addressed unresolved emotional issues, they often also received spiritual benefits but I saw symptom relief as a primary obje objective. I had noticed that people would, they would have collateral benefit with spiritual benefits, but that was kind of thank you for a side effect. The primary thing is to make your pain go away. And then one day I was facilitating a session and the person was kind of complaining about, it's taking so long, it's hurting, it's like, why isn't God going faster? Now, one of the cool things about the Emmanuel approach is if Jesus is still in there and they ask a hard question, he's like, ask Jesus. <laughs> so I, she's like, why is it taking so long? Why is it hurting so bad? Ask Jesus. So pauses for like a couple of minutes and she says, she reports, let's see, did I? Um, where in, oh yeah, right. So when I first started using this manual stuff, my idea was, hey, we've got new tools to help make symptoms go away faster. That was my original, my initial perspective. And then this one session, she says, she reports, Jesus says, I love my children and I'm glad to free them from suffering. But the primary, most important purpose of all this emotional healing stuff is to remove the blockages that are between your heart and me. The primary, most important purpose of emotional healing is to remove the blockages that hinder your heart from coming to me. And he also, he, he, he attuned to her about her pain. And all. I mean, he's, he's, he's wise and he does attune me. He knows about all that. He didn't ignore her pain. But this was, we, both of us, we looked at each other and we're like, Whoa, and I made her repeat it like three times so I could write it down. <laughs> 35 years in psychiatry, I have never once 
had somebody come in and say, can you help me remove blockages so I can have a better relationship with Jesus? It almost makes you grateful that it just seems to be wired so that the blockages that hinder you from connecting to Jesus happen to cause pain. And even if you don't pursue healing because you want a better connection with Jesus, you will pursue healing because it hurts. And isn't it a nice side effect that you're also going to remove blockages and get a better connection with Jesus? So that's like a simple yet central part of the manual approach for emotional healing is the priority, the number one priority is to remove blockages between you and Jesus, and the symptom relief is a wonderful side effect. Okay, so a manual, emotional healing to the manual approach for life. The real short summary is, once you, so we started asking Jesus at the beginning of the session for guidance, and I'm thinking he's going to tell us like what to do for emotional healing, right? Like, so which memory do we work on today? Well, sometimes he would say like, doesn't want to do emotional healing at all. He would, oh, wait a minute, you can do that? Um, which is another one, now it's obvious, but it hadn't occurred to me before. He would, oh, no, I want to do some mentoring, or I want to just spend time with this person, just to hang out with them. I want to increase their capacity. So he, he expanded the whole thing, and we realized a manual approach for emotional healing is just one part of the manual approach for life. And there's all kinds of fun stories in there, but I don't have time with, for them, so you can read the book. <laughs> all right. Another thing is, okay, expand, just, right, expanding beyond just emotional healing, and there's a session where the, it actually this, we got it on video, one of these interesting interactions between me and Jesus and the person. It's fun to watch. There it is. Um, and also outside of special sessions, the idea of the person on the highway, the person in the dentist office, like he wants us to use these tools to be able to improve our connection with him all the time, not just like on Thursday afternoons when you're in my office. Another one, like once it occurs to you, duh, but Somehow it wasn't so clear to start with. Okay, so a manual approach journey 2022. So here I am at almost 62 years of age with striking similarities to my four-year-old self. I still want to understand how everything in the world works. I still believe that Christianity and science are particularly important sources of truth that will best help me with this. I still work very deliberately to integrate my Christian faith with my science. And I still want to be a part of God's plan for caring for the world. The really big difference is my discernment regarding how the Lord wants me to help, how the Lord wants me to participate in his plans. No longer doing nuclear physics. Now I perceive that the most strategic way I can participate in the Lord's work is to combine biblical principles with brain science in order to help people connect with the living, interactive, wise, powerful, life-giving, loving, compassionate, healing, always present friendship presence of Jesus. Yes. <laughs> and my perception about how to do that for me is to help people learn about and practice the Emmanuel approach for emotional healing and for life. Thank you.